All right, so in the last class, we were looking at two different implementations of data flow graphs, one of them for an FIR filter, the finite impulse response, and the other one for the IIR or infinite impulse response filter. And what we concluded from sort of looking at the iteration periods over there is that as far as the FIR filter was concerned, <coughs> it is in principle at least possible to reduce the iteration period indefinitely. In other words, you can bring it all the way down to zero, provided that you have sufficient hardware available to you. Okay. Whereas in the case of the IIR filter, that's not possible. Even if you have access to infinite amounts of hardware, the very nature of the graph beyond a point is going to put a limitation and therefore restrict how much you can reduce the iteration period. Okay. So what we are going to do now is to see whether we can actually come up with an a way of theoretically estimating what the ideal iteration period bound of a given system is. Okay, So the assumption that we are going to make is that we have a digital signal processing system and it has been represented in terms of a data flow graph. Okay, And every node or every actor in the data flow graph, we have access to some kinds of hardware. Some hardware is available. For each and every actor present in the data flow graph. Okay. Now this is an assumption which in turn will impact the estimates of the iteration period bound that you get. So one thing to keep in mind over here is when we are deriving this iteration period bound, okay, so that's the term that we are going to use. The iteration period bound is what is the minimum iteration period that can be implemented for a given data flow graph, assuming that you have infinite amounts of hardware. Okay. But in addition to that, there is one more assumption that we are making over here, namely that the hardware itself is of a certain type. So when I say that there is a hardware realization, what I mean is if I need to add two numbers, I assume that I have a certain piece of hardware that is capable of performing two input addition and it has a certain delay associated with it. Okay, So that delay could be in nanoseconds, it could be like half a nanosecond, one nanosecond, 10 nanoseconds, whatever, or it could be in clock cycles. So let's say that I have a serial multiplier, it might be something that takes 10 clock cycles, in which case my unit of time essentially is going to be clock cycles. <coughs> right? Why I'm saying that is it's important to understand that on the one hand, the unit that is used in order to represent your timing or to represent the delay associated with a piece of hardware is not important. But what is important is that you are making an assumption that your hardware has certain delays associated with it and the amount of delay is dependent on that hardware. Okay, So whatever iteration period bound that you compute is dependent on two things. One is your data flow graph itself. And secondly, what technology you are using, what kind of hardware elements you have. Okay, So if you move to a better technology, let's say that you, know, you go from 180 nanometer to 90 nanometer or 45 nanometer technology, presumably every single hardware unit, your adders, multipliers, etc. will become faster and therefore your iteration period bound comes down. Okay, That is not our concern. Our assumption is that you are working within a given technology, your hardware is therefore restricted according to that and subject to that, what is the iteration period bound? That's what we are trying to find. Okay. So subject to these assumptions, right? what we can sort of say is what we are going to do is to draw up a set of what we are going to call constraints okay? and to perform essentially some kind of constraint analysis. Okay, So an example of a constraint is simply something like this. Let's say that I have two actors A and B. Okay, I don't care whether these are adders, multipliers, FFT blocks, adaptive filters, 
right complete image recognition blocks i don't care i don't care how complex a and b are the only assumption is a is one self contained data flow block meaning that it performs in a data flow manner whenever it receives inputs if it has any in this case it doesn't seem to have any but whenever it receives inputs as required it is capable of generating outputs okay there is no other sort of constraint no other requirements for it to function whenever it gets data it can then consume that data operate on it and produce outputs similarly b is also of the same type that's the only assumption i'm making okay so with that in mind a and b are two arbitrary actors i'm going to make an assumption that d subscript a and d subscript b are the execution delays of these units okay so this is where the hardware assumption comes in i am essentially assuming that i have some kind of hardware be it a adder or a processor that is capable of executing code whatever something that will take da units of time in order to complete the ex one execution of a okay so da and db are i am going to call them the execution delays of a and b okay now i am going to introduce two variables x a and x b and i am going to say that these are the starting times of some iteration of a and b <coughs> why am i putting some within quotes because the assumption over here is that the iterations are infinite right these are dsp systems as long as data is present they will continue to execute they will consume data they will do something and they will generate outputs so i don't really have a precise starting point okay so i need to arbitrarily define some point in time as my starting point rather than just saying a time i'm going to call it an iteration number right in the previous cases we wrote down basically iteration 0 so i would say a0 was the first iteration of a a1 is the second iteration and so on so you can call it that if you like so you can say the zeroth iteration if you like okay so xa and xb essentially refer to the starting time of that zeroth iteration of a and b okay given this much information da and db are known they are given to you okay you don't have to calculate anything over there these are just numbers that are given to you a and b are some kind of actors in the signal processing graph you don't care what the functionality is you only know that the output of a is consumed by b xa and xb are unknown and you want to find out what they are okay what can you say about the relative values between xa and xb can xb be less than xa let's start with that right no that doesn't make sense because the implication of drawing a diagram like this where i show that the output of a is being consumed by b is that only after a has finished execution b has the data ready for it to execute okay so we can go one step further and we can make a stronger statement not only is it that you know xb must be greater than xa xb must be greater than xa plus da right it has to wait until a has finished okay so we can basically write down this statement over here xb is greater than or equal to xa plus da i'm going to allow the equal to under the assumption that as soon as the data is ready you know it can start executing okay this in other words is the fundamental constraint that i have with regard to this pair of actors in a data flow graph okay xb must be greater than or equal to xa plus da okay all right let's take this further what if i now had once again two actors like this right same da db and all i'll assume i'm not going to write them again but now there is a 
token over here right a token or this is where the terminology can get a little confusing i sometimes also call this d as a delay element so i'll try and avoid that terminology as far as possible i'll just call it a token the reason why it's sometimes called a delay element is because it's a one sample delay okay so if you do come across that terminology used somewhere saying that there is a delay element between a and b what it means is that this is a one sample delay in other words if a is producing x of n b is not consuming x of n it's consuming x of n minus 1 the previous output of a essentially okay so if i have one token like this one sample delay on that edge between a and b now what can i write about xb and xa what would you say over here now do i still require that xb must be greater than or equal to xa plus da it's no longer so clear because xa plus da is the time when the nth iteration of a is completing but b is not waiting for the nth iteration of a it is waiting for the n minus 1th iteration okay so here i need to introduce a val a new value t which i will call the iteration period okay and essentially iteration period t over here is sort of saying that this is the you can call it the average time if you like but essentially the time between iterations okay and ultimately what we are going to do is estimate what is the minimum possible value of t that i can successfully use and this is essentially going to be my iteration period bound okay the minimum value of t is what i am looking for now if i have a certain t and i say that this is my iteration period effectively what i am sort of implicitly conveying by that is to say that if the nth iteration of a finishes at some time ta the n minus 1th iteration would have finished at ta would have finished by ta minus t okay so in other words i can write down this constraint as xb is greater than or equal to xa plus da which is the time of the nth iteration finishing minus t this minus t essentially allows me to say one sample delay one sample earlier what was the time the when it would have completed okay which means i can now generalize this and say instead of one sample if i had n sample delays what would the constraint look like xb must be greater than or equal to xa plus da minus n times t okay so this t is just introduced as a new variable a metric that we want to compute which essentially allows us to say that this is the time required for completing one iteration okay so if you want to find out at what time the previous iteration completed just subtract t two previous iterations subtract 2t n previous iteration subtract nt okay so in this way we can see that if i have n delays or n token sitting on that edge between a and b the constraint that needs to be satisfied over there is xb is greater than or equal to xa plus da minus n times t okay good how do we take this forward and now see whether we can come up with an actual constraint what should the minimum value of t be okay so let's first of all look at these graphs itself so i have one this is supposing this is the entire graph right there is a whose output is being fed to b with n delays on it okay xb must be greater than or equal to xa plus da minus nt okay that's the only constraint i have available to me under these conditions is there anything you can say about what is what should be the minimum value of t okay 
what can be the minimum value of t which for which i can so what am i trying to do i want to be able to find some value of xa and xb such that this condition is satisfied okay that's all i am saying all that is given to you is da and db and n those three values are given to you t you do not know i am asking you to find out what is the minimum value of t and xa and xb you do not know i am asking you to find any possible values of xa and xb for which this condition can be satisfied okay so first question can t be negative that does not make sense right because by the very nature of the iteration period it's sort of saying that this is the time between one iteration and the next iteration so by definition pretty much it has to be non negative okay so now that we know that t must be greater than or equal to 0 the question then becomes can t be 0 okay and yes if i set t equal to 0 i can just pick any value that i want for xa for simplicity just choose xa equal to 0 right let t equal to 0 let xa equal to 0 any value of xb greater than or equal to db will satisfy this constraint okay so in other words it's possible to find just choose arbitrarily a and b or other xa and xb such that this condition is satisfied okay you might think that this is trivial so obviously we are going to next look at a case where i cannot do this trivially okay but this is what we are ultimately trying to do and if you think of it in the context of actual implementation of the data flow graph what we are interested in is number 1 the da db etc are given to us along with the data flow graph so that tells us what needs to be implemented and what are the hardware complexities the amount of time that will be required for each of these blocks to execute we are interested in computing a value for t that is the minimum iteration period under which this system can get executed and we then want to find out what should what are possible values for xa xb etc which will allow us to successfully actually execute this on hardware right in practice those xa xb etc will probably be some time instance some clock cycle or something else which is determined by some finite state machine controller which says okay at this time instant let this particular block start functioning okay or if you are talking about a fully combinational circuit then there may not be a finite state machine controller it's just going to be determined by as and when one unit finishes the next basic next unit consumes its data and then starts executing generates output etc okay that goes into a so called self timed mode of operation so now that we are we have put this in context how is this going to be used let's look at a slightly more complex example which will tell us which will show us one scenario where i cannot just choose t equal to 0 and get away with it okay right i have da is the execution time of a db is the execution time of c dc is the execution time of c and i mean before going forward let me just write down what would be the constraints that i have right now okay what would this correspond to i need to have xb greater than or equal to xa plus da xc must be greater than or equal to xb plus db and xa must be greater than or equal to xc plus dc okay so i have these three constraints that need to be satisfied okay is this possible what is there a problem here and if so what is it right how can we show that there is a problem with this setup over here the simplest way that at least i can think of over here is just add the constraints okay 
no matter what x a x b x c are this is the same on both sides which means we can basically remove it and what we end up with is d a plus d b plus d c must be negative for this to work okay which is fundamentally a contradiction because d a d b d c are execution times they are the amount of time taken for a given function to execute and by definition again that cannot be negative okay so what it tells us in other words is there is a problem over here this is an invalid data flow graph right how do we fix this i can just have one delay element on any one of those edges okay let's see how this fixes the problem right but at least conceptually this is exactly the same as what you would do in the case of a combinational loop in a circuit right a combinational loop in a digital circuit is not permitted for synchronous design you must have at least one register somewhere okay conceptually this is exactly the same thing right and if i write down the equation or the constraints corresponding to this what i will see is xb greater than xa plus da xc greater than or equal to xb plus db now i have xa must be greater than or equal to xc plus dc minus t okay and that t that i have introduced over here has suddenly changed the whole thing okay if i now once again add and i cancel out the xa xb xc what i'll get is 0 greater than or equal to da plus db plus dc minus t or in other words t is greater than or equal to da plus db plus dc okay what does this mean <coughs> one iteration of this data flow graph must be greater than or equal to the time required for executing each of the individual units completely okay so a has to complete then b has to complete then c has to complete only then one iteration of this data flow graph is completed okay very natural very intuitive right and fits with what we can sort of understand of these data flow graphs as things stand let's take this one step further what if it has n tokens that we had over here right if i write down the equations do the cancellation etc what i'll end up with is 0 greater than or equal to da plus db plus dc minus n times t okay or in other words t must be greater than or equal to da plus db plus dc divided by n okay now this is a little more interesting because what it's telling you is physically what i have is a b c sitting in a loop there are n token delays somewhere in that loop okay in this case on the edge between c and a but what it effectively means is that in principle at least the average iteration period that i can achieve for this system is going to be da plus db plus dc by n right the fact that there are n delays somewhere in that loop means that conceptually you can think of it as n copies of this could somehow be executing at the same time and producing n outputs okay how do we do that how do we actually implement such things in practice we'll get to that later but right now we are just talking about the physical bare minimum constraint right the only real constraint that you can put on this is t must be greater than or equal to da plus db plus dc by n you could also say t greater than or equal to da plus db plus dc but that's too pessimistic you can actually do better than that da plus db plus dc by n however is fundamental i cannot do better than that okay 
this is essentially the iteration period bound okay for of course this fairly simple graph that we have over here okay how do we take this forward how do we extend the concept of iteration period bound beyond a single graph like the single loop like this let's take an uh, other example supposing i had this right as my data flow graph what would you estimate is going to be the iteration period bound over here now what i need to do is actually look more carefully at it and say okay how do i actually come up with the iteration period bound right where did the iteration period bound come from in this previous thing because of the fact that there was a cycle in the graph or a loop okay so effectively it looks to me as though what i need to do in this more complex graph is identify all the loops okay the first question is is that possible and secondly once i have done that then how do i actually compute the iteration period bound okay so first i'm going to assume that it is possible to enumerate all the loops in this case what are the loops one of the loops that i have is this one over here right and the second one is this one over here okay which basically means that the b c b loop right i'm just that's one way of sort of indicating what the loop is it's go from b to c and then back to b so that completes the loop right this has a constraint saying that t must be greater than or equal to d b plus d c right because if i write down the constraints just for that one loop alone what i will end up with is there is one delay element on that loop and therefore t must be greater than or equal to db plus dc as far as that particular loop is concerned for the other loop what i have is a to b to c back to a okay over here what i'll find is t must be greater than or equal to da plus db plus dc divided by 2 okay because basically you'll end up with 2t you know da plus db plus dc minus 2t must be less than or equal to 0 right that's the constraint that you will see if i want to satisfy both of these conditions at the same time what value of t can i choose which one should i choose ha huh? the maximum among these two okay so in other words t must be greater than or equal to max of these two values right please keep in mind it's not obvious that that is db plus dc or that it is da plus db plus dc by 2 because it depends on the actual values which you don't know right now okay so you actually have to compute both of those and find out which is the maximum and then say okay t must be greater than or equal to that maximum value okay so if i have multiple loops then great this is one way of finding out the exact value of t okay that i can use there's just one problem for those of you who have done a course on algorithms you would probably know that what we are looking for over here is we need to identify all possible cycles in a general directed graph okay and in general the number of possible cycles in a directed graph can be exponential in the number of edges that we have okay in the number of vertices that we have okay so if i have n vertices in the graph right i can have a maximum of n squared edges right i basically choose any two 
uh, vertices and I can have an edge between them, right? But the number of cycles, in fact, I'll go one step further and call this a simple cycle. What I mean by a simple cycle is one where no vertex is repeated more than once, right? So in this case, for example, B, C, B is a cycle. B, C, B, C, B is also in principle a cycle. You know, I've gone through the same things and I've ended up where I started from. But that's of no interest to me because I've basically gone through it more than once. I'm visiting the node B more than once. Similarly, B, C, A, B, again go to C and then B is also a cycle. But that is essentially a superset of the fundamental cycles because B, A, B, C, A is a fundamental cycle. B, C, B is a fundamental cycle. B, C, A, B, again go to C and then come back to B is no longer fundamental. Okay, So even if I restrict myself to just sort of looking at what are the fundamental cycles where I never visit a node more than once, right? in principle it is possible to have an exponential number of cycles in a graph. Okay, Now in the domain of signal processing, the kind of graphs that you are going to encounter are fairly restricted. You do not have arbitrary graphs with all kinds of cycles or all kinds of edges in them. right? So in practice, you will probably find that the number of you know possible things that you have over here are restricted and therefore you do not have to worry about this exponential blow up in the number of possible cycles. But that does not help you in general if you want an algorithm to be able to compute the iteration period bound. Okay. As an alternative, right? So, in other words, if I want to compute the iteration period bound, this is one way of doing it. Basically, enumerate all the cycles and compute. Okay, find out this max among all of the cycles. Another way of doing it is to basically say, let's say that I have an arbitrary graph, right, with some many vertices in it, right, with correspondingly many edges. For each edge in the graph, write down the constraint x, let us say the vertex goes from some node i to j, right? xj must be greater than or equal to xi plus di minus nij times t, where nij is the number of token delays present on the edge between i to j. Okay? And in general, if I write down all of these things and then sum them up, right? what I will find is that I will ultimately end up with something which looks like this. I will end up with a set of many different constraints. right? And you know, in each of those cases, basically I will end up with t must be greater than or equal to summation of di divided by summation of nij right over where the summations are essentially over a closed cycle in the graph right the di is essentially the total execution delay through the graph uh, through the cycle And the sigma nij is total number of token delays in the cycle. Right? So, in other words, it is possible to just write down this set of constraints, and somehow maybe from that I can get a value for what this t is going to be. In practice, it turns out that an alternative way of looking at this is to say I am not going to actually go about you know computing this uh, for all loops. In other words, you know identifying all the loops is basically the problem that I am having to deal with. So rather than trying to identify all the loops and then compute this t that way, another way of doing it is to say assume a value for t. Right? One possible value could be just summation of di over all nodes in the graph. 
right this is obviously very pessimistic but the point is choosing a large value of t is always safe right that's like saying that if i choose a large clock period for running a synchronous digital circuit it is always guaranteed to never have a setup violation right as long as my clock period is large enough in other words as long as i operate my circuit slowly enough i will never run into a problem in terms of timing okay so choosing a large value of t to start with is always safe and then i can go through <coughs> check all the constraints of the form xj greater than or equal to xi plus di minus nij into t what do i mean by check the constraints the problem that i have over here is the xi values are unknown okay so over here what i can do is start with all xi equal to 0 if there is a constraint violation set xj equal to xi plus di minus nij into t for whatever t that i have chosen at the moment okay this step has a specific term associated with it not in the context of signal processing or in data flow graphs it comes from the domain of normal shortest path algorithms in graphs right this is a step called the relaxation step right or a relaxation of a constraint right and in particular this is used in something called the bellman ford algorithm for finding shortest paths in a graph okay effectively what it is saying is this is one way by which i can try and arrive at a suitable value of x i s okay now what will happen as a result of doing this initially i might end up with you know choosing one value of initially all my values of x i were zero if some particular constraint edge constraint was violated as a result of doing this i will have to change that xj i repeat this n number of times where n is the total number of nodes in the graph okay by that time i should have got to the point where all my constraints are satisfied and that is guaranteed because i have chosen my t large enough okay i can't prove that in within this class but if you look up the way that shortest path algorithms work you can sort of understand why this works right if i repeat this process of relaxation a maximum of n times where n is the number of nodes that i have in the graph it is guaranteed that i'll be able to find a suitable set of values of xi okay provided my t is large enough okay now if this works i can try and reduce the value of t and try again that is to say go back to checking the constraints and running this okay so by sort of iteratively going on reducing this value of t i can eventually arrive at the smallest value of t for which it is possible to find suitable values of xi right i can go one step further you can think of i mean you are probably already familiar with the idea of binary search right i can actually use binary search over here so basically if one particular value of t is satisfied then i can straight away go to t by 2 and try again right then t by 4 let's say t by 4 fails then search between t by 4 and t by 2 keep on bisecting until i can get t to whatever level of accuracy that i need okay 
this is a practical algorithm it can be used it's not probably the best possible algorithm but it it is one of those things which is intuitively easy to understand why the thing works and how it is basically trying to find a set of solution to a set of constraints okay so to summarize what we saw was you can think of the iteration period as basically being the time between successive iterations of a data flow graph any given token delay on an edge can be considered to be saying that you know i need the data from one iteration earlier and therefore the constraint that needs to be satisfied on that particular edge is that the execution time of the target must be greater than or equal to the finishing time of the source minus whatever number of iteration delays are present and if i have a graph of that sort with iteration delays present on the edges and i have cycles in that graph then there is actually a fundamental constraint on what is the minimum value of t that can be used for the graph how can you find it this algorithm is a general way of solving it but a simpler approach especially for signal processing systems is probably going to be just identify the loops in the graph <coughs> compute the average sigma d by sigma n find the maximum among all of them and that is your iteration period bound okay so like i said this is sort of the theoretical basis for what is the best possible performance that i can get out of a given data flow graph under a certain constraint of technology keep that in mind my da values are constrained by technology so in other words if i move to a better technology right 28 nanometers 20 nanometers and so on i'll probably end up with faster execution units that itself is sufficient to reduce my value of t but that is not what we are interested in okay subject to this constraint of technology this t is a property of the data flow graph it's a theoretical minimum bound how do i actually achieve it in practice that is a problem because you might find that in reality in order to actually get close to that bound i need infinite amounts of hardware okay so what we are going to do next is to look at more practical situations if i have a limitation on the amount of hardware available to me what is the best throughput that i can get and what are the ways by which i can go about improving that throughput systematically okay we'll stop here for now and continue with those topics tomorrow <coughs>